Nog maar. Wel wat. This scene from Women Talking takes place in a hayloft where a group of women gather to discuss what they are going to do and how they're going to respond after a series of violent attacks in their community. Men and women would make all decisions for the colony collectively. Women would be allowed to think. Girls will be taught to read and to write. They take on everything, including their relationships to each other, but they have a very short window to make this decision in. The men have left the colony. They're going to be back within a day. So there's this enormous tension of having to come to this giant decision with all of these philosophical and ethical issues attached to it. The women of the colony that we meet in this gathering, they've all suffered something almost unspeakably horrific, and they are all dealing with it in their own particular ways dictated by their own temperament. The schoolhouse must display a map of the world so that we can begin to understand our place in it. What I really loved about this scene is that it explores one that's often not spoken aloud. It's kind of in an emotional way, something that they translate with each other. The women have three choices. They can stay and forgive, they can stay and fight, or they can leave. And because they aren't all on the same page, this discussion is so important. A new religion taken from the old, but focused on love, would be created by the women of the colony. Our children would be safe. Collectively. You sound like August's mother. Sarah is enormously well prepared. She broke down every scene. She went through every shot. She talked about how she was going to cover it. Yeah, yeah saying at the okay. same time, you could okay. use this. Awesome. Yeah, do yeah, you like that? Yeah, that's great. That's that stuff. Beautiful. Thank you. The first Hayloft scene we did 150 times over two days, like nine pages of dialogue, which I've never done. We were all in this very strange room together all the time where we didn't really see the outside world. And I do think we went slightly mad. It's nine actors in a room going through heaven and hell together. That to me feels a bit unprecedented. That level of commitment and intensity it was sort of inconceivable until we got here. Guys, listen up, please. Thank you. This is from beginning to end, just pausing once to uh, reset the paper. But then we kind of honed in on ways we could make that more workable. And if anybody loses a line, just yell out for Consuelo. Yes. It's really wide, and we'll obviously be cutting into this a lot, so we'll just keep going. Okay. It was many, many takes because the camera was on each person, and there were nine of us. So nine times, and however many angles, that's a lot of takes. Everybody's point of view is huge on their own, but to actually allow that debate and allow that vulnerability and allow that strength and the conviction and the unknown evolve, to let these extraordinary women like Claire and Rooney and Judith and Sheila and Michelle step into that space was what I think Sarah enabled. Anna, you're a dreamer. We're women without a voice. We have nothing to return to. Even the animals are safer in their homes than we women are. All we have are our dreams. So of course we're dreamers. It was so fascinating watching the actors, just seeing how hard they work and the commitment to this story. <laughs> The casting process took almost a year. There were so many people who could have potentially played every part, but it was also finding the chemistry and the alchemy between them. Everybody cared about this project, and that level of care they brought established this atmosphere of respect. The most important thing that I would want to say about this cast is that they are an ensemble. They sit in a different place, not just because of their age as women, but also because of their experience as actors. So they kind of ground the stylistic choices that Sarah was making in the room. And you want to hear my dream? I dream that people who speak nonsense, who have no grasp on reality, are not put in charge of making statements. It was a very intense experience. We all knew each other's lines, like the back of our hand, like we knew what had happened in that room. We never left each other. It was a community. And I think by putting us together and having us form our own bonds with each other, in addition to the ones we were creating within our roles, it really helped amalgamate the characters into the story and bring some real truth to life moments. What if the men refuse to meet our demands? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 
We'll kill them. No, Anna. <laughs> Sarah talked to me a lot about the weight of this decision that these women are about to take. You always talk to me about how epic you wanted this decision to feel visually, but also still not shy away from the intimacy. So we can do the whole pair that takes her. Yeah. Uh, we do this and over, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. There's no real use of the hair in doing that. No, we just do it this way more dynamic. Thank you for that. Yeah. That was good. We spend months together talking about the film, looking at images, creating images, thinking about how we can create something specific to each film. Sarah and Luke chose to keep a lot of people in one frame, and I think that that was a really interesting way of telling the story, so that you always felt the presence of other people. That barn was extraordinary. It was a work of art. Peter Costco didn't just construct the hayloft technically in a way that was easy to film in. He made it a place that held that debate. We originally start here in a darker, more secluded place, but as they begin to take control of the space and take control of their lives, these doors and windows get opened up to reveal the outside world. There was this tendency to want to make the barn more of an enclosed, smaller space. Sarah and I talked about going the exact opposite than that because you want to feel more like they're almost reinventing their faith. So we had this idea with Peter to make the loft more like a cathedral. I thought of a different kind of truss system that we were able to build that made our interior set a lot more manageable to shoot in. We had two columns in the hayloft space, so that gave Sarah and Luke a lot more freedom. Peter's work was meticulous. He's an incredibly skilled builder, and he was embracing and inhabiting the characters as he created their spaces. What if the men who are in prison are not guilty? Mother. Oh, oh child. Why are you asking if Dude, shush. We caught one of them. Ah! I saw him. But only one. Yes, only one, but he named the others. But what if he was lying? We must consider this. No. No, that is not our responsibility because we aren't in charge of whether or not they are punished. Sarah really put so much time and energy into who was not just in that hayloft in terms of the actors, but like every crew member, every head of department. She cultivated like such a group of people that made it possible for us to make this thing. Yeah, so what's a way we could just quicken up the action of it coming down? Does anyone have any ideas? I love working with Sarah and hearing her take on the story, and she could not have been more supportive of my explorations and of my input. So in the field talking, telling August what happened. That's what that was. <laughs> this is day one, but there will be some playing in the field. Yep. Kita was an enormous asset to the film on every level, and I think we were all completely blown away by what she did. Even though these women have a very strict mode of dress, there were minute details in the way these women dressed which expressed their character. You would think, given the look of the film and the ethos of the community, that the costumes would be made from cottons and organic materials, but these costumes are made from practical fabric for a very practical lifestyle. As soon as all the hair and the dress was on, like the big braids in the back, like I felt so in it. I had my socks and sandals. I had my polyester dress that Kita made herself. The headscarves uh, were put on very specifically. That level of precision in terms of even patterning and the types of fit, it really made you feel like you were having an authentic experience. Everything about the film just came together so beautifully. We said that this would now be the bar for work. It was such a wonderful collaboration. We know that we've been attacked by men, not by ghosts or Satan, as we were led to believe for so long. We know that we've not imagined these attacks, that we were made unconscious with cow tranquilizer. The conversation that these women have in this hayloft addresses the harm of power imbalance and violence and hierarchical structures we live in. They are dealing with ideas and concepts and the future and the past and who we are and those things need to be discussed and talked about. And I think that's why the film's so extraordinary is that she never pulled back from it.
It is thought-provoking and it's poignant, but most importantly, it is active. We know that we are bruised and infected and pregnant and terrified and insane and some of us are dead. We know that we must protect our children regardless of who is guilty. It's sort of an exercise in watching the human experiment at work where you can see people affect how other people think. You see people change their minds. You see people stay resolute. You see emerging of hope. And I think most essentially the scene asks the audience, what would you do? 